Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, like many of the honorees, I'm humbled to be in this, this group, and I'm learning so much. I'm uh, learning so much from the presentations. Um, I also want to thank the CNEN -E -E staff uh, for organizing all of these um, events for the past couple days, and of course, for my new moniker of Waste Wizard, uh, which is one I haven't used yet, but um, is uh, rapidly turning into my Halloween costume, thanks to my <laughs> students. So, um, and they say I have to keep running with it, so I'm going to keep running with it. Um, but I'm really here today to talk to you about reimagining wastewater. And in my lab, how we think about um, the molecular design of both materials and processes uh, for resource recovery, which we define as making, making or extracting valuable products from what most people consider waste. So hopefully by the end of this, I have you reconsidering um, waste in a new way um, that can be a little more um, profitable and sustainable. Our story starts with three main observations. One, that wastewater is plentiful. Wastewater is generated on the order of 10 to the 15th liters every year. What this means to break this down is we generate about 3 trillion 2-liter plastic bottles of wastewater every day. And on a personal level, that's about 780 liters of wastewater a day, or 200 gallons. Um, and of course, this includes industrial wastewater, but the point is we're releasing tons, literal tons of wastewater into the environment as we speak. And so what we think about is the fact that wastewater is plentiful, it's also heterogeneous. Most of the time when I say wastewater, people think about flushing the toilet and what happens when you go to the wastewater treatment plant, as shown here. But wastewater is actually very heterogeneous. It contains different waters of different compositions. And for instance, if we're looking at gray water, which is the water that comes from everywhere in your house or office building except your toilet, that contributes the majority of water in domestic wastewater. Feces, unsurprisingly to most people, contributes the majority of the carbon. But urine, um, which is something I've studied uh, in maybe more detail than anyone wants to know about, but uh, I'll tell you about it anyway because I'm on the stage. <laughs> but uh, urine has the majority of nutrients in it, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, those same nutrients that we use and fertilizers are coded for, even though urine is only 1% of wastewater volume. Lastly, white wastewater is diverse. We think about municipal wastewater, but wastewater as a category includes things like acid mine drainage and includes things like agricultural wastewater. And so just for a brief picture of expanding this definition of wastewater, um, th these are some of the other things we're talking about when we talk about wastewater, whether that's from energy production or from urban runoff, stormwater, or agricultural runoff, like I mentioned. Wastewaters kind of get a bad rap because we think about them as containing pollutants, which absolutely is true. Um, these pollutants, like nitrogen in some cases, and uh, phosphorus as well, can cause eutrophication, which is shown here. And this is simply the production of algal blooms that can uh, deplete aquatic systems of oxygen and lead to cascading effects in aquatic ecosystems. Um, one example of this that's kind of mind-boggling, because this happens every year in the Gulf of Mexico, is that there's a dead zone, a hypoxic zone, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico that happens from nutrient runoff all along the Missouri-Mississippi River that's the size of New Jersey every year. And so this happens every single year, 5,000 square miles. There's a big zone of, um, of low oxygen levels that you can actually see from space. And so we, of course, acknowledge the fact that wastewater contains pollutants, but we also try to resituate this problem as an opportunity. These pollutants in one setting can be products in another, and by recovering them as products, we can incentivize the collection of wastewater and really think about closing the loop. So the one we've thought about most in my research group is recovering nitrogen as ammonium as fertilizer uh, from urine because that's where it's most concentrated in domestic wastewater. But I wanted to give you a little broader sense of the work that's going on in this field um, in my research group and beyond. Um, things like recovering phosphate and potassium, which I've already mentioned. Things like recovering hydrogen fuel from uh, different types of wastewater. And also making commodity chemicals like hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide from desalination brine, which is in some ways the waste of wastewaters. Um, and this has gained increasing attention uh, because we really have to think about closing the loop, right? We're no longer at a place where we have the luxury of a linear economy in some ways. We have to think about making things more circular and redefining um, waste. If we think about, uh, biology can teach us this in some ways, but for, in biology, waste isn't really a concept, right? Someone's waste becomes someone else's input, right? And we can think about making our industrial ecology do this um, in the same way. And this is a report from the United Nations in 2017 that details some of um, the potential of wastewater. Like I said, one of our major philosophies in the group is, is that extracting products from wastewaters can incentivize collection and intensify treatment. What I mean by incentivize collection is the fact that 80% of wastewater that's collected is discharged without treatment. Right? So 
a mi minority of wastewater is even collected to begin with, but the vast majority of that 80% is discharged to the environment without treatment. So uh, nitrogen, again, is a case that we think a lot about. And so in most cases, um, in industrialized settings, wastewater goes to our treatment plants, and we try to remove nitrogen from it to avoid uh, the eutrophication that I've already talked about. We do this with a set of coupled biological processes that have been well honed over the past few decades, nitrification, denitrification. And these are very useful. They convert nitrogen as ammonium to nitrogen gas, which, of course, is innocuous to emit to the atmosphere. However, when you expand your system, system boundary and your control volume, as, which as chemical engineers we think a lot about, if we think about fertilizer production, we sort of do the reverse, right? With the Haber-Bosch process, we take nitrogen gas and reduce it um, to ammonium as fertilizer. And so what we think about is if you look at this loop, we're really using two energy-intensive processes, Haber-Bosch to produce fertilizer and nitrification denitrification for wastewater nitrogen removal. And we're using nitrogen gas as a very expensive and energy-intensive intermediate. So our question is, let's close this loop, shortcut it, and recover nitrogen from waste in its reduced form that it's already at, but now, our, now the challenge is to make it a selective separation. And by intensified treatment, I mean reduced cost, energy inputs, and reduced chemical inputs as well. And so we focus a lot on selective separations because we have to make high purity products, right? So in the removal paradigm, which is not bad, but is simply the way we've done things and it's served our purposes so far, um, in the removal paradigm, we can do oxidation, and oxidation works to, for pathogens, it works for trace organic contaminants, it works for dissolved organic matter. Um, and it also works for nitrogen, right? We oxidize nitrogen from ammonia to nitrate, and then we partially reduce it back to nitrogen gas. But if we're talking about recovery, we need to make high purity products because we're talking about plugging this in to an industrial supply chain, right? We can't have, if we want to make a nitrogen fertilizer, we can't have a large amount of phosphate or a large amount of organic matter. So now, now that we're thinking about selective recovery, we need to think about high purity. And so we do that by thinking about ammonia disinfectants, ammonia fertilizers as shown here. We want to recover those and concentrate those, but we need to exclude other contaminants like trace organic materials or antibiotic resistance genes. And so I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of what we're doing in, in my lab, in my research group, um, and then give you basically one slide on each of these. Um, so first is we think about the material side, designing adsorbents for resource recovery. Second, we think about designing novel processes, and our focus is on electrochemistry as a platform technology for these selective separations. Third, we think about contaminant fate, so extracting the good and leaving behind or transforming um, what can threaten human health or aquatic ecosystems. And finally, we think about resource-constrained communities, uh, which Lisa mentioned, and is uh, some of our work in, uh, these are pictures from Kenya, uh, with the sanitation service provider there. So let's start with the adsorbent side of things. So what we're doing right now is synthesizing and screening multifunctional adsorbents to increase the selectivity uh, for nitrogen as ammonium. Uh, we've recently gotten inspired by some ammonium selective transporters found on Animox bacteria, and we've looked at the um, amino acid sequences to see what are the side chains that are really um, conferring this ammonium selectivity. And so, of course, most ion exchange resins for cations in particular are made with negative charges, and so we've started this with uh, sodium fumarate and sodium acrylate, but we've started looking at, as well, um, kind of copying the side chains of the amino acids you just saw in the last crystal structure. So for serine, um, looking at heme and ALMP, and similar ideas for phenylalanine and histidine. And here we're using polyacrylamides simply because they're cheap, abundant, and we can customize them in different ratios. Um, so this is the synthesizing part, and then we screen these in um, large, large um, combinations. And so what we're trying to do here is take advantage of the fact that ammonium is a really unique cation, right? Especially in wastewater, compared to things like sodium, potassium, um, calcium, magnesium. Ammonium is one, polyatomic, and two, it can confer some hydrogen bonding that we can really take advantage of. And so this is what we're going for with these different monomers that confer hydrogen bonding, potentially with delocalization, cation pi bonding, and of course the standard ionic attraction. On the process side of things, we've developed a new process called electrochemical stripping, and uh, the idea here is that we use uh, electrochemistry uh, to selectively recover nitrogen based on two properties, its charge and its, vo and its volatility. So this is our electrochemical reactor uh, with uh, three chambers, an anode chamber, a cathode chamber, and an acid trap chamber. We feed urine. This was originally developed for urine, but we've since used it on other uh, high nitrogen content wastewaters into the anode. And uh, based on the electrochemistry, there's an external circuit where electrons move, and those electrons are supplied by the oxygen evolution reaction. 
because there's, a, there's negative charges moving externally and through the circuit, there's an impetus for positive charges to move as well. And here's where we select for nitrogen based on charge with a cation exchange membrane. Once ammonium is in the cathode, um, the oxygen reduction reaction occurs, and so we've generated hydroxide ions here. And so we get an in situ pH increase without having to add any chemicals. Um, and so that uh, transforms ammonium into ammonia, which as many of us know is volatile, and so that's where we select for volatility. So now we've selected based on charge and volatility, ammonia gas is, through, is coming through the membrane and rapidly hydrolyzes back to ammonium. And so what we've made here is ammonium sulfate, ammonium and sulfate because we use sulfuric acid, and ammonium sulfate is a common liquid fertilizer. So again, what we've done here is concentrated ammonium based on charge and volatility. Um, just because data is important and you shouldn't just believe what you hear, um, here's a, uh, the nitrogen mass balance in terms of mass of nitrogen versus time, and just seeing that the nitrogen leaves the anode, comes into the cathode as an intermediate, but 93% of it ends up in the trap. So this is indeed um, a, a good recovery process, and we do have additional selectivity data to support that. We also looked at um, rate limiting steps, we're chemical engineers, so that's a term we love to think about, um, and so we're thinking about uh, the fluxes through these two membranes, and which one is rate limiting, and how can we build a, a true operational framework to better understand this process uh, that we developed at the concept level. On the contaminant side, um, we're thinking a lot about pharmaceuticals uh, in urine and in other wastewaters, in urine in particular, because urine contains 65% of the pharmaceuticals that we excrete. Um, so this is, of course, something we need to think about. In particular, the effects of urine treatment processes on pharmaceutical fate. So um, this was some of my, my postdoc work at University of Michigan with uh, Krista Wigginton, who's in the audience, and uh, Nancy Love. And so we took this screen of, of, of many different urine treatment processes, some new and some old. Um, and what we did is we um, established a concentration factor for, it's kind of a, a, a cost-benefit ratio here. The pharmaceutical is uh, potentially uh, damaging to human health and the environment. The nutrient is the product that we want to see. And so we took this uh, non-target screening approach where each of these um, lines here is a different peak uh, found through high-resolution mass spectrometry, and we're looking at the intensity fold chain, so effluent over influent throughout a treatment train. And once we do this, then we can start to identify these different compounds, um, like naproxen or some other pharmaceuticals. And I'm giving a talk uh, tomorrow more about that. Another part of this philosophy is that we want to work at multiple scales, and that's because working at the lab scale is not enough if we're trying to really change a paradigm, right? We have to think about the unit process scale and also the systems level scale. So at the molecular level, um, we think about molecular mechanisms at the process. We're designing and evaluating these new processes. How well does it work? How can we optimize it? And at the system scale, we consider aspects like life cycle assessment to say, what if everyone in the city adopted this? What would actually be the effect on greenhouse gas emissions? So I'll walk you through the ion exchange case just so you can see how these investigations feed into each other. So at the molecular scale, I already introduced you to the new beads we're making and these multifunctional adsorbents uh, that can demonstrate nitrogen selectivity. At the unit process level, what we do is actually put this in a fixed bed, which is how the treatment would most likely occur in an engineered process, and we generate um, breakthrough curves, for example, where we can compare um, the effluent concentration over time or bed volume uh, for different uh, adsorbents, and this is something we've done for existing adsorbents already. And then at the system scale, like I mentioned for life cycle assessment, we can start to ask really insightful questions like, of the whole uh, new ion exchange process, one, how does it compare to existing approaches? And two, um, what's the biggest contributor to energy and greenhouse gas emissions? So here, uh, we did this analysis for a, a San Francisco kind of thought experiment, and most of us thought before doing this that it would be transport, right? Transporting ion exchange cartridges around the city. Um, but we were completely wrong, uh, which is okay, uh, and taught us something. And it's really the acid that we used it, originally, the sulfuric acid we used to regenerate um, the resin is actually the biggest contributor. And so this drove us back into the lab to think about alternative regeneration schemes. But the key part is this is an insight that we wouldn't find if if we waited until the technology was mature, so to speak, to then uh, optimize it. So on the last part of what we do, uh, we think a lot about resource-constrained communities, and this is how I got first interested in this work, was thinking about um, limited access to sanitation for um, billions of people around the world. And so we've taken our ion exchange techniques and we've applied them uh, with a partner in Kenya, um, and we've shown that the value here was that urine-derived fertilizers were locally sourced because most fertilizers have to be imported into Kenya. And so this graph is just showing the cost per kilogram nitrogen, and you can see our ion exchange process is 70 to 80% cheaper to produce than fertilizers, uh, than uh, importing fertilizers into Kenya. 
We also looked at repeat performance over time and scaling up our process tenfold from one toilet scale to 10, 10, um, to 10 toilets. Um, and this is something we've begun to spin out in a, in a, a startup company called Electrosan that partners with sanitation service providers around the sub-Saharan Africa region. And just to wrap up here, um, we really believe that these, um, what we're doing at the molecular level can really impact these really big, wicked problems, as we call them in the development engineering space. And so in terms of the sustainable development goals, of course, we tie into the clean water and sanitation, but also the circular economy and thinking about environmental protection as well. And so we approach scarcity from many angles, right? Water scarcity, energy scarcity, um, food and fertilizer scarcity, and of course, sanitation scarcity as well. Um, and so uh, this also ties into really big questions, like can we make pollution extinct, right? These are the big things we're talking about. And in some ways, that's a new idea, but in other ways, this is an excerpt from the Clean Water Act in 1970. That was the goal originally. We've sort of gotten misguided and incremental, but the goal was really to eliminate waste completely. Um, and, and we also think about big questions like how can we maximize the resonance time? How many times a molecule goes through our circular economy as we're designing uh, these 21st century um, scarcity mature and scarcity um, resilient uh, economies? And finally, just on a more personal note, to me, uh, when I teach an introduction to chemical engineering class, and um, some of the feedback I've gotten is the, the, my, their favorite lecture, despite my love for mass balances and stoichiometry, is really when we talk about the big challenges. Students are entering uh, our universities thinking about how do we solve the big challenges that I hear about every day, right? Climate change, water scarcity, energy scarcity. And I see our work on resource recovery as a way to connect those really big problems all the way down to the molecular scale and say, here's the work I do and here's the impact it can have. And so we've done this through a variety of videos that have been released. Um, also, I shamelessly use the fact that urine is intriguing to people um, to get them to ask questions, to get them to think about our work. Um, so this video in particular is called something like How Your Pee Could Feed Billions of People. Um, not my title, but it gets people talking about it, right? Um, and also through some of our, our business competitions as well. And I really see this as a way to open the door to get more people from all backgrounds involved in chemistry because these are global challenges that we all have to, ma have to navigate. So with that, I'll acknowledge my wonderful uh, research group and some funders, and I'm happy to continue the conversation later. Thank you.